Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, and Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. Good. I'd like to follow up on my weekly report on whether or not women should have to register for the draft. And there are some people, and sometimes I'd like to use a very nasty word about these people who do it, they think that it's best we have equality in this country. So if men are being punished, do we want equality? So we should punish the women equally, and therefore they should serve in the military, be uh, in combat, and all, of course, uh, be drafted. That contradicts uh, this whole bit in the news again. Uh, there's talk in, in, in Washington about it, and, in, and nationally there are a lot more articles. And I keep thinking, you know, uh, wonder what's wonder why it's all of a sudden of an interest. I, I hope they don't have a subtle mysterious plan where they might need more troops. But anyway, it, it is out there, and there were some uh, recent uh, uh, rumblings on the National Defense Authorization Act <laughs> that uh, Duncan Hunter came up with a bill, and I think you know something about that. Here, Duncan Hunter, you know, is positively opposed to women in the military, which is justifiable, but he, his is for the wrong reason. Um, so he was being foolish in the committee, and he wanted to uh, ridicule and mock them and say, well, you don't want women in, uh, in, in combat, so we'll prevent them from being drafted. So he offers this amendment just, just as a joke and said, the women will have to be uh, registered. And he thought everybody would come down hard. Guess what? It passes the committee. So it's <laughs> risky in Washington on what you might propose uh, um, by being cynical. So now, here we have Duncan Hunter working now very hard on how he's going to make sure he defeats his own amendment when it comes <laughs> to the House War. Typical Washington legislation. Talk about unintended consequences. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Carter signed, as you, as you pointed out, back in 1980 in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Proclamation 4771, it was called. <coughs> How ironic that 21 years later we invaded Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. We never needed those troops. But, you know, we've had it through our history. This is the latest iteration. Um, nobody likes it. Nobody wants it, really. The military doesn't want it. Conservatives, many of them, uh, remember and don't want it. But somehow it's lost its sense of controversy, and I think it's the conflation with the word service, serving your country. It's, it's ennobled, whereas you would have a different S word, I think, to describe <laughs> it, which is uh, yeah, a word it, that's outlawed. You know, and this has been around for so long. As long as we've had history, we've had compulsion of governments to use people to fight, uh, fight their wars. Matter of fact, it's in the Old Testament when the uh, uh, Israelites... Uh, were unhappy because they didn't have a strong king. They were looking for a king. One of the things they wanted, they wanted to have, uh, you know, conscription back again in Samuel. Warn them, don't do it. They're going to have conscription, and then you're going to have unnecessary war and drag your kids. But that's, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago they, they talked about this. Well, our history has been filled with it, and uh, I want to uh, read a quote from Daniel Webster to set the stage for the moral arguments against the draft. There's a lot of practical arguments against the draft. But uh, in, eight, in the War of 1812, uh, you know, when D.C. was under siege, uh, Madison was promoting the idea that we have to have this, this draft uh, in order to beat the, the, uh, the British. So uh, I, need to t I need that uh, up on the screen, please. Um, I, and so when, when this happened, of course, uh, Daniel Webster went down to confront him. But he gives us a very, very long spontaneous speech, which is just a great speech. But uh, the one thing here that we've gotten out of the speech, a, a, a special quote. Here's Daniel Webster in the midst of this debate. A free government with an uncontrolled power of military conscription is the most ridiculous and abominable contradiction and nonsense that ever entered into the heads of men. Pretty strong, and uh, of course I have had a quote in my congressional office for a long time from Robert Taft, which wasn't quite that strong, but it was pretty good. Yeah, it's 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 very unfortunate. Now we we are talking about women being allowed in combat roles, and that is that is passed, and it's more of a social experiment, you know, than than the national defense issue. But it is very unfortunate that some of the people that may have been allies, anti-war allies, and have been would have been opposed to the draft, maybe sort of enticed into supporting this idea on the grounds that it represents some sort of equality for women, some sort of a, a great progress for women. This is the bizarre nature of this argument when they don't understand what civil liberties are all about. 
So if somebody has a disadvantage and somebody doesn't, isn't exposed to it, they think equality is making sure everybody is exposed to the disadvantage. They do this in taxation. Instead of saying, well, if somebody has less taxes uh, than the other, why don't we just lower the taxes for everybody? But why should we think equality is equally punishing people? That's why I think the feminists were completely wrong on this issue and said, yeah, we, we, we want to be equal like men and we want to make sure they can get shot at like a man. Now we want to make sure they can be drafted to go over and fight wars that we shouldn't be fighting. And they get satisfaction that, boy, this is equality for women. Well, uh, you know, if they're not under this, they have special, uh, special protection. But I want equality for men, too. I don't want anybody to be forced into these things. And, uh, but to come up with a solution to saying that we're having more equal equality by punishing women the same way we punish men, which more or less is supporting for war uh, in, in many different ways. And what, you know, if you can address the whole idea, uh, there is a push for people across the spectrum, the idea of national service, and they dress it up to make it sound so nice. You got to serve your country. It sound give something back from what you give. What you're yeah, I, I could describe what I think our national service about is that everybody taking care of themselves and minding our own business and not depending on anybody and not using the government to get special benefit. But in in 1979, when this came up, I was working with some with some liberal Democrats and one uh, uh, one congresswoman I work with closely. On the first go around, we won the vote and uh, we defeated the reinstitution uh, of the draft. And immediately after that, she went downstairs. Uh, when we stopped the military draft, she <laughs> introduced legislation for social services, mm -hmm. you know, and conscript everybody and all that. She, you know, they, they're missing the point about what liberty is, is all, all about. But, you know, I was exposed to some discrepancy with the draft as well. Uh, the draft generally uh, drafts people from 18 to the age of 25. And uh, of course, it was stopped in the early in, in the early 70s, but in the 60s, it, uh, uh, it was still still on the books because the Vietnam crisis was going on, and I got my draft notice in the, in the 19, uh, 1962. But I was uh, I was older than t 25. I was nearly 28. Had two kids and one on the way. But they called me up and went to uh, Santa. Ana. But there was always a medical draft, an MD draft, which was different. They they back then the medical draft law for doctors was up to the age of 20, uh, 51. Wow. You, you <laughs> could you could draft them, and uh, so there's you know everybody's equal except some people are more equal <laughs> or or more victimized than others. So I I think this is. Uh, but th this has been around for a long time. One of the more arguments is, well, this is what this is what you have to pay for your freedom. Yeah. Sort of like Oliver Wendell Holmes says, eh, don't sweat the taxes. That's what you pay for civilization uh -huh. to have an uncivilized government uh -huh. stealing your money. But that's that's the argument of some. We have to pay for our freedom. How far do you think they should be able to get with that argument? I thought our freedom came from our Creator. That's at least what the Declaration says, and, and not our not our government. You know, the, the other thing, and this is a more of a practical argument, Dr. Paul, and it's, it actually, to be honest, it hits home because I have a 16-year-old son, and I have a, you have to, I've been thinking about this for a number of years, but if you look at the selective service registration, it sounds innocuous. Until you look at the details, what if you're not that enthused about doing it? The penalties might surprise some people. First of all, the legal penalties. Failing to register is a felony. You will always have a felony on your record. You face a $250,000 fine, five years in prison, or a combination of the two. The other things that happen if you don't register, you're ineligible for federal student aid, for most state student aid, for some state employment, uh, security clearance, most federal employment, federal job training. If you're looking to get your citizenship, you're ineligible for that. On top of those federal penalties, there are additional state penalties that are put on people who don't register. And what's most insidious is a lot of states, including our beloved Texas, unfortunately, automatically registers you for the draft if you want to get a driver's license. So if you don't want to register, well, then you don't get to drive. You don't get to do any of these things. And the DMV automatically transfers electronically your information to the selective service without you knowing it. Okay, but the argument 
from the other side is, well, there's no war going on. Nobody's uh, being drafted, so why worry about it? And if there is a major war, we'll need the men, and we, we, we need to get them, and I guess we'll need the women. So they, they justify this. And, and right now, nobody really cares about yeah. that because they're not, they're not concerned about liberty. Uh, and and they're, they can be convinced that, you know, ISIS is out there. You know, uh, they might you know, uh, land their airplanes and shoot missiles at us or something someday, so we have to have to be ready for these uh, these troops. Well, that's just like the Patriot Act. You remember the time. What are you worried about? They're only going to spy on the bad guys. They're yeah, not the bad guys. That's so right. Snowden yeah. came around and we yeah. found out something Yeah, different. all what they want to do to the jihadists or as well as what they're dealing with are the suspects <laughs> that they may do harm. But one, one term that I used back in 1979 that has stuck, and I used it last week as well, uh, to try to uh, embarrass conservatives because conservatives are pretty good in their arguments about not registering their guns. Why yeah. should they? I mean, that is the ultimate uh, physical defense of, the, of an intrusive government was the right to own weapons. That was why they wrote the Second Amendment. It wasn't for hunting. So uh, that, that was, uh, the conservatives understand this. So I said, I, I put it right on them. I said, you people, you conservatives, you don't you think more of your guns than your kids. Yeah. You're down here begging the government to register your kids. At the same time, you'll fight tooth and nail so your guns don't have to be registered. Why don't we uh, make sure that we neither have to register our kids nor register our guns? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds that sounds good. If I can just really quickly say one thing, and I think there are organizations out there that are helping young people struggling with this very serious issue to, to, to look at at age 18. Uh, you know, our old friend Bill Galvin on this, in the Center on Conscience and War, he's helped a lot of people, including our friends, uh, 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 the Pavonis, who got out of the Air Force, if you remember. But uh, they have a wonderful website, Center on Conscience and War, and they give advice to young people who feel like they do not want to serve in the military, uh, but they are obligated to register for the draft. And uh, you could look on the site for more information, but they say, you know, print in, le in legible black ink on every uh, communication with Selective Service. I am a conscientious objector. Make copies of this. Make sure you uh, prepare a personal statement of your beliefs to back it up. So there are steps you can take if you decide to go that route. Right. You know, the uh, Supreme Court rule on this issue that we're talking about, women uh, being registered uh, back in 1980, and uh, they didn't act as civil libertarians, and they hadn't read uh, uh, Daniel Webster's speech <laughs> at all. And their reasoning was, it was sort of pragmatic reasoning that uh, Congress says they can't fight in combat, so why register them? So, you know, that was, that was their argument. So they ruled against the uh, forced registration of women. And besides, they said it was counter to American values, sending off women to defend our country, you know, well, what about sending men off to war needlessly by force uh, to fight a war which is a preemptive war? Maybe there's a immorality and not part of the uh, American values. The trouble is there's a lot of talk about American values and American exceptionalism, but there's a lot of confusion about really what has made our country a little bit more special than others, and it happens to be the principle of civil liberties and personal liberties and not collective liberties and all this confusion about the draft the women's draft and the doctor draft and preemptive war, or ignore the Constitution on declaring war, we have to be prepared. Uh, there's, there's so little concern about that, and so they nitpick there. So the Supreme Court didn't do anything. They could have sorted it out and just wrote something that said the, all the, the, the whole draft ought to be thrown out, not just the, uh, the registration in the draft for women. How sad, that great point you made. Uh, everyone's remembered the slogans of American exceptionalism without actually remembering what it is that makes us exceptional. That, that is for sure. Well, unfortunately, I, I'm afraid this issue is going to stay around for a while, and hopefully it does, uh, and we can build momentum to explain to the American people and the young people, this should be a young person's issue. But, you know, they, uh, they are saying that uh, it's uh, necessary. The, the uh, left, or one of the arguments the left uses, is uh, we need massive registration because then we will make the people more anti-war. Because it was the draft and it was all the slaughter in the 1960s of Vietnam that woke up the people. 
But why can't we wake up the people before that happens? But there's some of the anti-war people who were against the draft in the 60s now say, let's have the draft, and then the people will start to rebel against these constant wars in the Middle East. But that again, sacrificing more liberty to try to make a point which is supposed to be protection of our liberties makes no sense whatsoever. It should be based on one principle, and that is what liberty is all about. And the other thing that we drift into and make so many mistakes about is the fact that we see people in groups that need protection or penalties where it's always the, uh, always the individual that counts. So this is, a, this is an important point, and also one thing that people forget about when they're defining civil liberties is they don't talk about property being a civil liberty. And so much violation has occurred, uh, you know, against our liberties because they violate our properties. They know that we have a certain amount of privacy in our house, less so now with the surveillance going on, but in a way the house is supposed to be our castle. But as soon as you step out of your house and into your uh, store up front, all of a sudden you don't have any rights. But it's the property, it's the church property or the synagogue property, that's, that's what protects us, or whether it's the property of the TV station uh, or our computers. So it's, property is very important protection of civil liberties. But right now there's a lot of confusion. This debate that's going on now is uh, making it worse. And in a way it's ironic that Dunker Hunter is now all confused because he has to get rid of his own amendment because he was just making fun of it because he wants, uh, he, he, he wants the draft, he wants the men, but of course he thinks it's a disadvantage militarily to have women. He doesn't deal with the issue of liberty. That's what this program attempts to do. We work very hard at it because the issue is liberty, and that to me is most important. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon. And nationally, there are a lot more articles. And I keep thinking, you know, uh, wonder what's, wonder why it's all of a sudden of an interest. I, I hope they don't have a subtle, mysterious plan where they might need more troops. But anyway, it, it is out there, and there were some uh, recent uh, uh, rumblings on the National Defense Authorization Act <laughs> that uh, Duncan Hunter came up with a bill, and I think you know something about that. Here, Duncan Hunter, you know, is positively opposed to women in the military, which is justifiable, but he, his is for the wrong reason. Um, so he was being foolish in the committee, and he wanted to uh, ridicule and mock them and say, well, you don't want women in, uh, in, in combat, so we'll prevent them from being drafted. So he offers this amendment just, just as a joke and said, the women will have to be uh, registered. And he thought everybody would come down hard. Guess what? It passes the committee. So it's <laughs> risky in Washington on what you might propose uh, um, by being cynical. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, and Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. Good. I'd like to follow up on my weekly report on whether or not women should have to register for the draft. And there are some people, and sometimes I'd like to use a very nasty word about these people who do it, they think that it's best we have equality in this country. So if men are being punished, do we want equality? So we should punish the women equally, and therefore they should serve in the military, be uh, in combat, and all, of course, uh, be drafted. That contradicts uh, this whole bit in the news again. Uh, there's talk in, in, in Washington about it and inter, uh, fight their wars. Matter of fact, it's in the Old Testament when the uh, 
uh, Israelites uh, were unhappy because they didn't have a strong king. They were looking for a king. One of the things they wanted, they wanted to have, uh, you know, conscription back again in Samuel. Warn them, don't do it. They're going to have conscription, and then you're going to have unnecessary war and drag your kids. But that's, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago they, they talked about this. Well, our history has been filled with it. And uh, I want to uh, read a quote from Daniel Webster to set the stage for the moral arguments against the draft. There's a lot of practical arguments against the draft. But uh, in, eight, in the War of 1812, uh, you know, when D.C. was under siege, uh, Madison was promoting the idea that we have to have this, this draft uh, in order to beat the, the, uh, the British. So uh, I, need to I need that uh, up on the screen, please. Um, I, and so when, when this happened, of course, uh, Daniel Webster went down to confront him. So now, here we have Duncan Hunter working now very hard on how he's going to make sure he defeats his own amendment when it comes to the House War. <laughs> Typical Washington legislation. Talk about unintended consequences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Carter signed, as you, as you pointed out, back in 1918 in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan proclamation 4771, it was called. <coughs> How ironic that 21 years later we invaded Afghanistan. Yeah. <laughs> we never needed those troops. But, you know, we've had it through our history. This is the latest iteration. Um, nobody likes it. Nobody wants it, really. The military doesn't want it. Conservatives, many of them, uh, remember and don't want it. But somehow it's lost its sense of controversy. And I think it's the conflation with the word service, serving your country. It's, it's ennobled. Whereas you would have a different S word, I think, to describe it, which is <laughs> yeah, a word that's outlawed. You know, and this has been around for so long. As long as we've had history, we've had compulsion of governments to use people to fight. But he gives us a very, very long, spontaneous speech, which is just a great speech. But uh, the one thing here that we've gotten out of the speech, a, a, a special quote. Here's Daniel Webster in the midst of this debate. A free government with an uncontrolled power of military conscription is the most ridiculous and abominable contradiction and nonsense that ever entered into the heads of men. Pretty strong. And, uh, of course, I have had a quote in my congressional office for a long time from Robert Taft, which wasn't quite that strong, but it was pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate now. We, we are talking about women being allowed in combat roles, and that is, that is passed. And it's more of a social experiment, you know, than, than the national defense issue. But it is very unfortunate that some of the people that may have been allies, anti-war allies, and have been, would have been opposed to the draft may be sort of enticed into supporting this idea on the grounds that it represents some sort of equality for women, some sort of... Uh,